Paul writes to Timothy, and obviously Timothy is a young leader. He, he's actually working more in an apostolic role within an area. And, um, but the context that he's going to speak to Timothy as a young kind of work on Paul's team are very helpful for us in any place in leadership. Because I think Paul's going to be emphasizing um, how uh, the various things that we need to do to bring health into the church. And so in 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, and Timothy and Titus are great letters. They really are uh, letters where an apostle is actually writing to two young leaders. One's Titus, one's Timothy. Uh, they are serving alongside him within the churches. Um, but he says this, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech and life and love and in faith and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through the prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Uh, it's just gr it's great instruction of a, a leader to a young leader that's coming through. And, he, and I want to again just break it down. I, I'm br not bringing anything new. I'm just bringing you what the Bible says on these subjects. The first one he mentions is don't let anyone look down on you in this case because you're young. Timothy was very young and in that culture that would be something that would not have given him a lot of credibility. Um, and so one of the challenges in leadership is in some ways I have to lead and I can only lead if you give me permission to lead. And so the challenge for every leader, especially one that comes through the life of a church, is that your relationships change as you come into more. And so to, to illustrate what I'm trying to say, I remember years ago I, was a, I used to wave ski surf, which is a form of surfing. And um, there was a guy that was, um, he was world champ at the time, Nicky Carstens. He was actually the top guy in the world. I think he's, he's probably here somewhere. Oh, he's in the trans guy down holiday. So he was world champ, best in the world. And he was really, really good. And I was a young guy, probably about three years, four years behind him, uh, just coming through in surfing. And so in some ways our relationship was always, he was world champ. And I was a young up and coming guy through the ranks. And then I got saved and he, you know, he was still a way better surfer than I was, but I got saved and, and led him to the Lord. Um, and our relationship became then more peers. We became like friends. I, I came eighth in the world. At that point, he was probably become about third in the world. So we were pretty much you know, surfing very similar to each other in terms of our relationship. And we, we got on as friends. We got into drugs together and then uh, I led him to the Lord. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Actually, I led him into drugs and then led him to the Lord. And, um, and so we were friends. And, you know, and then at one point I came on to eldership and then even planting Josh Jen. And he backslid. I led him back to the Lord and we planted Josh Jen. And he came down. But he was, in some ways, probably saw himself as very much my equal. And I remember planting Josh Jen with this guy and... I realized this is going to be a really difficult relationship until I can help him understand that while I am his friend, I am his leader too. And I, I use the example of using different caps because sometimes when I was with Nikki, we would just hang out and talk surf and we're just friends. But there's times that I've got to cross a bridge with him and go, okay, I'm not talking to you as a friend now. I'm talking to you as a leader now. And I had to actually have that conversation with him. Um, and it was a little bit awkward, but I had to in some ways not let him look down on me because he knew me. Familiarity breeds contempt. I had to say, Nikki, Jesus has made me the leader here. I didn't ask for this. And I have to lead you. And I can't lead you unless you see me the right way. Do you see me the right way? Will you give me the right? Will you yield? Will you? And, and it, was, it was this changing point in our relationship, and we made that transition, and I'm still friends with Nikki, and we can joke with each other and be friends, but he's learned, okay, Andrew's not my friend when he's saying this now. He's saying this is my leader, and there's a different kind of response. And I think for everyone who comes into leadership in the church, you have to, in some ways, reestablish your relationships. About how is this relationship, and how does this work? And then even on the dynamics of an eldership team, the relationships change very quickly on any team because we're all changing at different paces and we have different capacities. 
So by way of an example, um, I'm trying to think of someone in the early days who shot past somebody else. Uh, let's say, for example, Ryan Kingsley. He now leads the church up in Benoni, one of the 412 churches. Ryan Kingsley joined up with us. He was a Christian, but he was very young. And many of the older guys, uh, Mark DeOfe, I could use as an example. Mark had come with us. He was in eldership long before Ryan was. Ryan was one of the young, Chokurkis, one of the young guys coming through. And he has an elder who's solid, mature, good Bible teacher. And so Ryan's coming through the ranks. And he would have led Ryan, he would have spoken into Ryan's life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge is Ryan has got something different on his life. So as the relationship moves, things start to shift and change. And at some point, Ryan is son of a peer, and there was a point in time when they were peers with one another. He was more of a teacher. Mark was, uh, sorry, Ryan was probably a bit more of a kind of an apostolic kind of leader. But then that relationship has shifted again. So Ryan Kingsley is now arguably one of the strongest apostolic voices in 412. In some ways, Ryan now could probably outrank Mark. His voice would be louder. Those are interesting dynamics to walk through. On an elder team, that thing happens. You get a team that's, you know, somebody's been there, he's the first elder, he's solid, he's solid, and it's going well. And then suddenly this new guy comes through and suddenly everything's changing. And we see this dynamic even in our Bibles. You'll see uh, when Paul and Barnabas start their journey, it's Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, Barn which means Barnabas is the leading figure. But then somewhere along the way, you see a shift. And it's Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. And one of the things that's key for us as we move forward is to understand who am I? What grace do I carry now? Where am I in relation to others? Because we need to know our place. We need to know what grace, what faith God has put upon us. The danger here is, the Bible says, don't think too highly of yourself. But in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. The reality of it is, we, we, probably 90% of us think too highly of ourselves. So we think we're better preachers than we are. And I remember years ago trying to illustrate that to my eldership team in the early days. Uh, some of them were here. I mean, some of the guys were always like, why aren't I getting more chances to preach? Because the people tell me it's amazing when I preach. Uh, and so I realized, okay, I don't know if that, that is as amazing as, because, as they think they are, but, but they think they are. So there's always this tension on our team because they feel like they're not getting the shots that they should be getting. And so I remember at one point having this brainstorm because we needed to know who we were in relation to one another. What, what grace do I really carry? So I asked the team. I think there were how many with us in that meeting? Can you remember? There were probably about 12 of us, 12 men and their wives, probably, maybe 15. Small eldership team in those days. And I remember saying, okay, so who's the best preacher in, in our, in, with all of us now? And I said, we need to be honest, not pastoral. Because pastoral is like, you know, you're amazing. We need to be honest. Just to be, let's get a measure where we are now. I said, okay, Andrew, you're the best preacher. Okay? So if I preach out of 10, what do I normally hit? If you're going to rate me in terms of Andrew hits it, what would I get? I said, you'd get a 7 normally, maybe an 8 on a good day. Okay, that's helpful. So there's a, there's a measuring stick. Okay, so now I would ask you to, if I'm a 7, sometimes an 8, I want each of you to weigh up yourself. How do you think you preach if I'm that? And then I want your wife also, without telling you, to tell you what she thinks. How, you know, how does she think you do if Andrew's a 7 or an 8? And, and I'm, I was setting the guys up because I knew, I, I knew that there were in some ways we, guys were thinking too much of themselves. And their wives often way too much of them because she here's the knight in shining armor. So, so the wives were like, yeah, why isn't my husband getting more opportunities, whatever it was. So I remember Russell specifically, who's actually grown in this now, and that was what I said to the guys. You can grow in grace, but we can't give you more than God has given you now. So I remember Russell at that time, I figured he thought if I was a seven or eight, I think Russell figured he was a six, seven. And I remember saying, so, okay, so Russell had, you know, in your mind, don't tell us. You, where do you think you are? Okay, no, don't tell us. And then I said, okay, guys, I want us to shoot straight. How well does Russell preach? And I think, I can't remember who said what, but I think one of the guys gave him a two out of 10. 
One guy gave me a three out of 10. And I remember Russell almost gagging, like, <laughs> like, like this is not what he was expecting, you know? Like, and almost like, is this a conspiracy? Is this a joke? Like, seriously? And then I could see Jenny was getting a bit antsy as well, his wife, and she was like, well, no way. And at one point, Russell said this, I don't understand this, because every time I preach, people tell me it's amazing and they love it. And I said, Russell, let me illustrate what I'm going to say now. I said, Russell, if I was going to ask, and we did that afterwards, who's the best pastor among us? Russell was extremely high on the pastoral thing, which means Russell loved people so well that he was like a father. So when your dad gets up there to minister, he's the best. <laughs> he loves us. The problem is visitors are arriving and they haven't felt that grace. They're just listening to him talking. <laughs> because that grace was not flowing. And so what happens is there's a difference between grace flowing to a man and grace, grace flowing from a man. Grace can flow to a person. When, when you love someone or you, you have it, grace flows to the man. In other words, we love him and yeah, we're with you and, and everyone enjoys it. But if you don't know, you just rate the man outside of that. And so yeah, Russell ended up, I think, about a three out of 10 at that time. And I think he has grown and developed significantly since those days. But it was such a learning curve for us as a team. Okay, how do I actually do? Because everyone thought too much of themselves. One of the challenges for us is we need to think in accordance with the measure of grace that God has put in our lives. Now, I always say this, comma, because I'm moving from one degree of glory to another. So I, I, I haven't yet arrived. I don't know. I might be short-circuiting something. I might be just some area in me that needs to change. But this is who I am now, and I need to know what that is. And I also need to know my area of influence. How much say has God given me? Not what I think I should have. That's the problem with Facebook. Facebook gives everyone the same. Actually, how much, faith, how much grace has God given me? And then I need to build my life accordingly. And so within every team, we need to get to the point where the teams learn who's what. So let's say, for example, if Howard came onto eldership, which I don't know he feels called to. If Howard came on eldership right now and they were both in my elders meeting, again, we want to listen for the voice of the spirit. But the chances are, which one would have a louder voice in swinging the, the church forward? <laughs> <laughs> Hence my point. <laughs> now, now let me show you this. But remember, but then there's also the change of dynamic of, yeah, when he comes on, and this is a problem, guys come on eldership, and they're like, hey, okay, I'm an elder now. And I'm like, well, hang on. You, you all, there were 12 apostles. You can't even name all of them. Most of you'd get to about three or four, maybe five, because we all know who the, who the strong leadership gifts ones were but we don't always remember the names of the others. And I think there's like that on every team, there's different grace. And when you come onto a team, you must understand you come with a measure of grace. And as you open your mouth or don't, your measure increases. And people will recognize the wisdom or the lack of it. As a leader, you're always building or destroying your own credibility. And we can't give you what God hasn't given you. I can't say to the people, listen to this guy because we think he's an elder. Because for a while you'll do it because you know me. But if you watch him long enough and you see cracks continually happening, at some point you draw your heart back from him and you're going, I don't know if I trust this guy. I can't give you what God doesn't give you. So you have to make sure as you grow in leadership that you are not damaging even the calling of God that he's put upon your life. You have to realize that every mistake you make builds or destroys the grace and the calling that God has put upon your life. And so be wise in how you do things. And normally the, the answer is what did Paul speak, the Bible speaks about. If you keep quiet, people normally think you're wise, but if you're too quick to share your opinion, sometimes... So these are things that teams need to work for, and you as a leader need to work forward in, in the sense of, who am I? And then what area of influence has God's given me? If you want to be walking into the mall, the, the key to getting into the mall is to be faithful with what you have. So I remember, you know, coming in through the church and laid down ministry and everything and, and joined the church and made tea because that's what they let me do. 
And I remember thinking, okay, I have no authority in this church, but I can make tea. I'm going to make tea well. I, I, I don't have a say in where this church goes because I haven't been given that authority. My opinion is pointless and meaningless because I have not been given the steering wheel. So what have I been given and how do I do that well? And I would encourage you, whatever area of influence God has given you, and again, it starts with the wife, it starts with kids, it starts with these things. But what area of influence God gives you, as you're faithful in that, God says, if you're faithful with little, I will give you more. And I, want, I, I don't want more for more sake, but I do want to be faithful. And so for each of us, there is a measure of, okay, what am I called to do? So let me say this, if you, if you get entrusted a home group, do it as well. Be found faithful in it as best as you can. Um, and as we faithful with little, there is more. But at the same time, realize that at the end of the day, your credibility, as much as we lay hands on you, is based upon you. I can't give you what God hasn't given you. I do not have that authority. If, I'll give you an example. If I were to get up now and say, I want to pick on somebody, if I, uh, let me pick on somebody that, <laughs> who's very secure. Howard. <laughs> Pick on Howard again. No. <laughs> if I had to make, um, if I had to say, I feel God's told me that this guy's the leader to take Josh Jen forward, I'm out of ministry for whatever reason. You would initially give him your heart. But every decision he makes either builds or destroys that which he's been given. And if he makes consistent mistakes, I often say, you know, in Israel, to, to illustrate this point, when Israel was called to go and fight the Philistines, there were two kings, the first two kings. The first one was named Saul and the second one was David. Saul was not doing well and making mistakes. And the fruit of that was he was losing battles. When the leader gets up and says, we're going to go and fight some Philistines, who's with me? And you look at the last three groups that went out and most of the guys came back dead. You're going, um, geez, I'm really busy right now. I don't know if I'm like... But then David comes through as a leader, and David wins his battles. He's been found faithful in the secret place. When David says, we're going to go fight some Philistines, you're thinking, we are going to whip them. David by himself will take out a hundred. Then he's got this circle and this circle and this circle, the mighty men. Those are actually even better than David. We are going to go and do some serious damage. And we're all excited. We've all got faith. The difference between a church of faith and a church of like, eh, is the leader. In the church, I often say in the Navy, the ship goes down and the captain goes down with the ship. But in the church, the captain goes down and the ship goes down with the captain. As leaders, we have to make sure that we steward the grace on our, God, on our lives well. And I can destroy... I can destroy what's taken, how many years now has it taken for the Lord to get me to where I am now? What's it? I've been saved in 1990, so it's 33, well, 33 years. I can destroy 33 years of building with a weak moment. <laughs> and I may never ever recover what God has given me with a weak moment. So, Young men, young women, win your battles now and hold your line now. Fight your fight now and grow um, and build. And, and again, gr don't let people look down on you because you're young, but at the same time, earn the right to lead. Earn the right to lead people forward. And then he says, but set an example for the believers. In and, I, and I want to jump into that word example because I think it's, it's the most important word in Christian leadership example I can only take people where I've gone as a leader um, I can only give you what I have and so there is a sense that people imitate leaders they imitate their faith they watch you to learn what they should do and it's a biblical principle it's actually right children do the same with parents that's why parents often say you see your, your kid does something and you're like oh my goodness they got that from me and that's exactly the stage with the church. So if you come onto an eldership team, the weakest elder, the least zealous, whatever elder will become, it'll create something within the life of the community that potentially is weak and not strong or not reflecting God well. And so Paul says, set an example for the believers. Set an example in speech, 
in life, you know, so let's jump it down there quickly. In set an example in speech. And again, I would ask you, what is your language filled with? Because speech can destroy nations. When Israel was going into the promised land, a land that God had promised them, they're on the border. 12 spies going, these are leading men in the community. God says, I'm giving you the land, go spy it out. But I've told you, I'm giving it to you, I'm with you. They go in and they see giants, they see fortified cities, they see the problems. And what happens is when they come back to Israel, they spread a bad report. This land is a difficult land. There are giants there. We look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And the 10 spies out of the 12 are negative, two are positive, which tells you how democracy works in the kingdom. It doesn't. <laughs> not in the kingdom of God. Might be the best secular thing we've got, but not in the kingdom of God. But, but 12, there's 10 spies actually destroy a nation. And so I would ask you the question as you come onto the team, as you come into leadership, you are going to see problems. Don't think you're clever because you see them. Because that's what happens. I'm suddenly seeing all the problems. I'm so wise. There's problems all the time. The church is always going from disorder to order. And as you fix this thing, that thing breaks. It's like a farm. It's always broken somewhere. There's always something not right. There's new people coming in, not reflecting values. There's old people getting lazy or pulling back. There's all the time. And so the danger is as we, as we look at these things, we've actually got to go, I went blank on where I was going now. Where was I going? Thanks, honey. So, so here's the thing. There are problems, and you need to see the problems. But the, the, the way of fixing them is not by waxing eloquent. We're all dying, the future of the church. I mean, you get language like this. Bro, I'm so concerned about Josh Jen. It's not what it was. We actually, you, you're killing us. You are killing us. It's been like that from day one. I've looked at Josh Jen as it is not what it should be. But we don't need to hear what we're not doing well. We need to hear how to do things better. And elders that start to pick up the problems, the giants, there will always be giants between us and the promise, always. There will always be real things. There were real giants. Those spies weren't lying. But if you see the giants and you don't see the promise, you become the death of that church. That whole community will die. And I say this because as young leaders coming in, very often, even the watchmen on the wall, they are the death of the church. They suddenly pick it up. And, and I remember years ago, a guy, uh, I actually heard about this preach, I wasn't there, but a guy got a mannequin in front of this church in a wedding dress, and he says, this is the bride of Christ. And, and then, you know, he, he got up and he started ripping the dress apart and saying, you know, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong. And it's not hard to do that. The, the challenge for leaders is not to pick up what's wrong, but to make what's wrong right. How do we make what's wrong right? How do we see the promise that God has for us? And there's always a giant between the promise and the reality of where we are, always. So teams need to develop the sense of... Um, a faith, a, a sense of, and they need to become the example. In other words, when there's an area of lack, don't talk about it. You live it differently. So if you're in a church, and love is always something a church loses because it's costly. And can I say this? I, I, this is one of the best illustrations I've ever, ever learned in leadership. I, I, as a young boy, we used to, we didn't have TV, so we used to go watch circuses. And a Boswell Wilkie circus would come to town and there'd be like clowns and bears and all sorts of things that they would do and acrobatics. And at one point I remember this man coming up and he had these sticks with plates and he would put a plate on the stick and he would spin it. And the plate, because it was spinning like a top, would balance on a little stick, which is physically impossible except for the fact that its movement is keeping it hovering there. Then he got another one and another one and another one. And I remember watching him as a boy being amazed. How did he do that? My mom would kill me if I tried that at home. And then, uh, and then I noticed as he was moving down the row, the momentum on the first plate had started to, you could see it was slowing down. And as it slowed down, it started to, to wobble worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And as he's going down, I can see he's watching. And at one point, before that plate loses all its energy and actually falls, because there's, there's not enough to hold it there, he runs back. 
And he starts spinning each one down the row again. But now he's just touching them. He does, so it's faster. And then he does another stick and another stick. And as he's moving, they start into... That is a picture of the church. As you build something into the life of the church, you get it going, you work hard, you spin it, you put energy into it, it moves. And it's like, yeah, we're worshiping where we should be. And then you jump to, okay, let's talk about giving. And as you're starting to touch that, this is already starting to go, uh, Okay, let's talk about loving. This is this point, worship's like. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> the church always goes from order to chaos. Always. And so leaders always have to swing it back. The, so the worst eldership meetings are the worship sucks. We're not giving anymore. We just gotta go back and spin those plates. Or build them properly in the first place if we haven't done that yet. Are you with me? Leadership is full of problems. In fact, it's how I led Josh Jen. Where's the problem? That was how I led it. What, what's a weak area? And instead of moaning about it and talking about it, I just decided I'm going to live the opposite of the weak area. I'm going to set an example for the believers. I'm going to make sure that the teams with me set an example because people imitate our faith. So... <laughs> And, and Paul mentions the fear is in speech. It'd be wise how you speak because your speech can now destroy the church. Are you, is your speech faith speech? And I'm not saying being stupid. I mean, 300 people left the church in the last two days and there's only 400 of you. There's a problem. We need to talk about that. You don't want to live in denial and stupidity. But at the same time, there is that sense of, is our language filled with faith? And, and I would ask you, what do you believe for us in the future? What do you believe God might do through us? <laughs> what has God spoken about us as a people? Why are you here? <laughs> and, and, and we need the, the faith speech to start to come. Speech of we're going to, we, 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 and we are a people that overcome, the Bible says. We are a people that takes a hold of things. We are a people that forcefully advances the kingdom. We are a people who have God with us. We are a people that we expect the kingdom of God to break in to the here and now. We expect the gospel to change lives. We expect baptisms and, and the, the, the deliverance. We expect these things. And our speech reflects the faith of our hearts. And so these are things that for me as leaders with us, you've got to guard and you've got to guard those things because you do see the cracks. And, and uh, there's all, Josh Jen is, how healthy is Josh Jen now? Out of, if I 100%. If I had a rate her right now, I'd probably say she, well, probably 65%, what she should be. If you look at us right now, we probably have, well, some of the measures I would use would be how many people are giving, probably 70, 75% tithing faithfully. How much of us are worshiping well? If we had to take the chairs out and say, we are going to go wild for Jesus, how many people are going to go wild with us? But as leaders, we need to set an example for the believers in speech. Watch how, and, and we need, to, again, coarse joking. You can't swear ever. Sometimes I've, in Afrikaans, used words I didn't know the meaning of, and I did actually use bad words. I was in Namibia preaching, and... You know, you just <laughs> grew up at school. Now I'm preaching in a language that I don't even understand properly. Talking about the honesty dopper wat Camille Pertlire dra, which basically means John the alcoholic that's wearing a giraffeskin clothing, not knowing what I'm saying. They had grace to me because they knew I didn't know what I was talking about. The fact that they even listened to me was a miracle. <laughs> but you can't use words. You can't use words that are, are bad, you, you have to watch your language. And I'm using it as a humorous illustration. And he says, uh, for the believers in speech, in conduct, and, and, and this is such a key thing, in how I live. Because what I am is more important than what I say. My life, in everything, in, my, in my, the way I conduct myself, um, the way I do life, needs to reflect the king in the kingdom. And again, how do I conduct myself in terms of submission? I, I lead for 12. Um, in some ways, I could say there's no higher authority on the earth in 412 than me. But am I a man also under authority? Christine was in a meeting with us and some others, the Zoom call with some of the core guys was it two days ago. The question is, 
I, I sometimes even with that core team, know better than they do in some areas, and she will still, and she'll know that, and she'll still watch me submit to sometimes what they say, because I want to be a man under authority. And when we're working as a team, even though I lead the team, at times I want to come under the team. Because I want to model something. I want to live something. I never want to be the Pope. I never want to be this untouchable leader that you can't touch me, I'm God's anointed. I want to model humility. I want to model submission. I want to model team always. I can say to the team, well, I, I hear you, but tough like I want it to go like this. And I could do that. But woe to me if I do. And so how do you model, how do you conduct yourself in the team? How do you conduct yourself with leaders? How do you carry yourself with them? How do you conduct yourself in actually loyalty to you? I mentioned this earlier, but you know, that men came to King David in the Old Testament under a lesser covenant than the one we in. And he was the leader that God had placed over them. And they said this, the mighty men came to David and said, we are yours, David. Success to you, son of Jesse. When a man comes onto an eldership team, he can't be fighting for his own ministry. He's got to fight for the team and for the leader of the team. His thinking needs to be the leader. And there's an incredible story in the Bible about um, Moses who's leading Israel. And at one point they're coming against, in a battle against a foreign army. And God says this, Moses, as you lift your hands, if you keep your hands high, as long as you hold your hands up, Israel will win the battle. So Moses gets up on the hill and Israel's already to fight and Moses lifts his hands and the battle starts and Israel is winning. But the problem is the battle's taking long and Moses starts to get tired. I mean, he's just holding his hands up, but you do that for a while. Even in worship sometimes, if the presence isn't very strong, I'm like, geez, my arm's getting tired. And the anointing's very strong. You feel like, oh. But Moses gets tired. And as he drops his hands, is the battle starts turning. And it's a fascinating thing. You're holding your hands up and a nation is winning a battle. You drop your hands and they lose the battle. And so Aaron and her come alongside him and they hold his hands up so that he's able to do what he's supposed to do. And just by holding his hands up, he can't do it by himself any longer. He's too tired. Israel wins the battles. The best eldership teams are men that will say, I will hold up the hand of the leader. I will stand alongside him. I want him to win because if he wins, we win. I don't need to win. I don't need, Will Marie was so good at this. He was such a gift to me and to us. Will used to say this. Somebody does the, sh does the shining and somebody else, someone does the polishing and somebody else, what did he say? It, someone else gets the shine. Will Marie gave himself to me. He did the polishing and people would love him and he would say this. And I didn't need him to say this, but he understood the kingdom. If you like what I'm doing, you need to meet Andrew. He can do what I can't do. And all the time he pointed past himself to the leader of the team. And we are who we are because of a man like him. He influenced and impacted nations. But his heart was never, I'm Will Murray. It was when he joined us, but that died somewhere. <laughs> when he joined us, it was, I'm Will Murray. But somewhere in this journey, he changed, he learned. And he, he carried a value. And, and because he honored others, he will probably be one of the most honored men in our history as a church, but he lived to honor others. And I think as an eldership team, this has got to become your heart posture. I live to honor others, and if I honor others, then God might honor me. See, I don't need to fight for my honor. If I fought for others' honor, God will honor me. But if I fight for my honor, then God will resist me. And so as the teams of elders and leaders, I would ask you, carry the heart posture that says, I want the leader to win. I want people to love him, I want people to look great. Don't sit there thinking, why aren't, they, why aren't they honoring me? Why aren't they coming? I mean, it's a funny thing, you know, as you grow in leadership. I remember once MC saying to me, baby, this is early days, baby, no one's coming to me for perspective. I think pastors' wives feel this sometimes. They keep going to some of those older women. Am I, am I? Honestly, elders' wives, who's felt that? Come on, show me. None of you. <laughs> Thank you, AD. One honest person. Thank you. Because there's people around you and they, and they are like, but here's the thing, you, God put you alongside me, babes. Not you, but Ems. You might, 
And so we, we run together. It's not about, with, it, it's about ultimately we pointing to Jesus. But get that heart value thing of point to the leader. If we choose leaders that want the glory, then we're stupid. We're not reflecting Jesus as well at all. But the teams always want to point to the leader. Success to you, O David. We are yours. And they give themselves to the leader. And that's an important thing. If a team isn't given to its leader, that team will not flourish. And there is a sense that I remember coming to leaders years ago, le learning these lessons before I was in leadership and going, I will give myself to my leaders. I will, and I love the story of King David because it was something that I took so to heart when I saw it reading in my Bible. You know, King David one day says this. This is the heart posture that we carry. It's, and I know I'm saying things that seem cultish. I know I am. But every truth has a corresponding truth. The leader's got to watch his own heart. But this from this side, and this is what I'm training, is what we have to carry. David, David is sitting with a bunch of his men. There's a fortified city. And um, I think it's Bethlehem, if I remember right. And um, there's a well there. And, and David is just sitting with his men. And I imagine they've been fighting all day. The battle's still going on. And he's, you know what it's like when you've been out in the bush all day and you go, imagine a Coke. <laughs> Ever been there? Like, if you, imagine a Coke. David does this. Imagine water from that well in Bethlehem. Just, oh. And, and, and three, if I remember, three of his mighty men, he's not asking them to do anything. He's just like, imagine. Three of his mighty men fight their way through the Philistine army <laughs> to get to that well. So there's a fortified city. Three men, at risk of their lives, because David said, imagine, fight their way through the army. I can imagine two oaks fighting, one oaks trying to scoop water up. Now they fight their way back out because everyone wants to kill them. There's a whole army. They somehow survived this and bring the water to David. And David's like, if you read the Bible paraphrase, it's like, what did you do? I can't drink this water. This was, you, 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 you put your lives in danger to bring me a glass of water. And he pours it out before the Lord. As an offering. So I'm not going to touch it. It's, it's holy. And what it does is it David's team becomes, the Bible says, his, his army became as the army of the Lord. Because God had angels in heaven who lived to honor and glorify him. And God somehow gave David on the earth men who lived to honor and glorify him. We are yours, David. Success to you, even if it costs us our lives. And because David's kingdom reflected heaven's kingdom, the kingdom came through David like it never did before. And he led Israel to its largest boundaries because of the men that God put alongside him. And if you see David, you see a man who got that kind of glory and never humble, repentant. We need teams that look like that because it looks like God. Jesus, who's equal with God, said, I say unto you nothing, Father, unless... It's what you want. Father, even if I pay the price on the cross fully to save the world, if I'm the one separated from God, if I'm the one who takes the sin of the world upon myself, Father, not what I want, but what you want. And the Bible says, and I often marvel at this, Jesus does the heavy lifting in salvation. I mean, the Father sends his son, which is a hard thing to do, but Jesus dies the way he dies, suffers the way he suffers, lives the way he lives. And then the Bible says, so therefore God gave him a name above every other name, that the name of Jesus every Bible. But then it says, but, but actually his name isn't above every name. There's one name higher than his. It's God's. So he wins the whole world. He wins you and me. He wins us to God. And then the Bible says, but on the last day, the son himself will bring everything that he's won and lay it before the father and say, it's yours. And he himself will bow his knee before the Father. <laughs> this is God. As leaders, this is what we need to look like. Am I making sense here? This is holy stuff. Leadership is a holy calling. And we need to learn the ways of our king. 
And there needs to be a unity and a, a, a oneness in us that Jesus prayed for, that we'd be one as the Father and He were one, which means as teams, this has got to become our posture. And so we have to work through issues. We've got to work through disappointments because the reality of it is, it's difficult to do that. And sometimes you don't feel like you get re rewarded or you don't get noticed. But a godly leader doesn't need to be noticed. He does it because that's what Jesus did. Even, and I love that again picture of the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, and and he's, he sees the price. Jesus sees the price. What it's going to cost him personally. And he bows before God in sweating drops of blood. I mean, this is not a, this is not a nice moment. Father, would you take this from me, this cup? I don't know if I want to drink this cup. This is going to be a bitter taste to me. It's going to cost me everything. But not what I want. But Father, what you want. And actually, for your glory, not for mine. Because Jesus is, does it for the Father's glory, not for his own. You think when teams start to look like that on the earth, truly kingdom of God has come. Now we see the hearts of men properly aligned. We need teams that work together that way. And I'm not saying we don't deal with leaders that are wayward and, you know, if a guy's leading the team and he's abusive and we need to deal with those things because the whole team has to reflect God. But I'm talking to you now as elders that potentially would come on. This is the heart posture. Does this make sense? You see this. And again, Oh, yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna actually balance that out. I'm just. I'm just gonna leave that where it is because I think it's a posture that I remember in my own life. Thinking I want to carry that posture. I remember the elders when I was in the church. If they said we we trust in God for this, or we, I was like, I am gonna set an example, even if no one sees it. I'm gonna be the one there. When they say, guys, we want you to dance wildly. If I didn't feel like it, I danced wildly. They said, guys, this is an important thing. It was important. Because I was a man under authority and I understood God had given them responsibility and authority over me. In other words, you say jump and I'm going to just say ha-ha, not why. And there was a posture that I carried and I, I want to carry for the rest of my life, that posture of God. I want to live for someone bigger than me, something bigger than myself. Be an example in everything, in, in, in the gift of the Spirit. You know, we need leaders to set, show believers how to prophesy, how to drive demons out, how to... And if you've never driven a demon out, ask God, God, set me up, please. I'd love that moment. <laughs> to learn your authority in Christ. To see creatures, man. Creatures that have been there since before the world was created. Far more powerful than we are. Far more powerful, thank you, Hans. I mean, I, I believe one, one angel, I don't believe, I know this, one angel kills 80,000 soldiers in one night in the Bible. One, man, one angel. And, and demons are fallen angels, so you get an idea of who we're wrestling with. And then you encounter one in a person that's bound, and at the name of Jesus, a creature that could rip you to pieces, destroy you, Bows its knee and starts to cry out for mercy. If you realize what's going on here, you're thinking, well, who am I that God would give me this? Who would I that God would entrust this to me? And to see the demon leave and the person set free. And then to remember that we rejoice not because they listen to us, but because he's written our names in his book. And he just an example for the, in the, for the believers in these things. And you're going to ask God. Never had that shot. Lord, give me a shot. Elders, if you're ever going to go drive demons, can I come along? Just make sure there's no sin in your life. Or <laughs> I never get driving demons out of this one guy. And it was a Satanist. And at one point, there were about six of us in a circle around him. And I was still a young Christian. And uh, so, you know, come out of him and the demon goes, <laughs> but it's like, not this guy. And I'm like, okay, this thing's talking now. And the demon looks at one of the guys. I'll never forget this. He says, you can't drive me out. But this evil voice, you can't drive me out because you masturbated three days ago. <laughs> and the guy just went, what? 
You can't drive me out because you're addicted to porn. Ha, 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 You can't drive me out because you haven't forgiven. Ha, 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 I said, keep quiet in Jesus' name before you got to me. <laughs> <laughs> be an example in church attendance and what's valuable remember this people learn by what I do not what I say we've got a 412 conference coming up as an elder of the Lord Jesus Christ and as a saint for me that was my priority of the year I'm like, man, I would have to be half dead to not go there. Whatever it cost me, I'd hitchhike there if I had to. To Bloemfontein, we used to hit I mean, because for me, this is a time when I'm sitting under apostolic input. I read my Bible. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. I want to learn, and I can tell you, those conferences changed my life. I would not be doing what I'm doing if I did not go to those times. I remember over and over again sitting there and feeling the Lord challenging me, convicting me of things that I wasn't doing or was doing and adjusting and adjusting and learning and, and getting stuff imparted. For me, an elder, man, your priority for 12 conference. When there's apostolic guys coming in, I would move anything I could to try and be there. Now, there's times that I can't. Although I wouldn't, it was one of the big conferences. But there's times that I can't. Let's say there's someone here and my sister's getting married. But even then. Because <laughs> I was devoted. I wanted to model devotion to apostolic teaching. You know, Josh Jen was birthed at that devotion. I, I remember once to give you an idea of this heart of submission and devotion. Uh, Dudley Daniels led the team that I was in. I came eventually, I planted the church, came into leadership, and then came onto his apostolic team. And Dudley one day said this, and this is, I just catch the heart of this. This was our value, this was Josh Jen. J Dudley said this, he had been an alcoholic before he got saved. He actually ended up not being able to minister because of liver failure eventually. So he drank himself badly and then got saved. And um, he hated alcohol. And what had happened to some of our guys as, fought, as, as New Covenant had gone into the nations and in Africa had enjoyed their liberty and drunk wine. And African pastors had seen them who didn't believe you could. And that had caused a whole nation to shut to us because somebody used their freedom and drank wine. And so Dudley was speaking this to us and he said, I wish I could ask you. I can't force you because the Bible doesn't, but I wish I could ask you to lay down wine. And I remember hearing it and just thinking, David's mighty man. I know I'm free to drink wine. But David just kind of mentioned, I imagine, God, I want to model something. My dad's a wine farmer. I'm laying down wine. I know I'm free to drink wine, but I'm laying it down because I want to model something. I came back to Josh Jen, and I said this, I, exactly that, I can't force you. But Dudley's asked, I'm going to do this. Would you consider it doing it with me? You're free, but, and I think the whole of Josh Jen went, will that done with you? Milani's dad was a wine farmer. My dad's a wine farmer. We laid it down for a number of years because we honored, wanted to honor the leader of the team. I knew I was free. He didn't try and tell me not to do it. I wanted to go above and beyond the call of duty. It, and I believe we caught the attention of God. I believe God saw that and said, now I'm going to bless you. Now Josh Jen's going to touch nations because you were found faithful. You gave beyond. You exceeded my expectations. I didn't even ask you to do that. You did it for me. Now I'm going to shower you with rewards. These things, I'm telling you, the way we posture ourselves in these matters, learn the value. It's not a law. It's, 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 it's actually love. That's what it comes down to. I mentioned you know, giving. Are there examples in, in prayer? Never arriving at the prayer. If the, if the, firstly, if you're going to call a prayer meeting, be wise if you're in leadership. But if there's prayer happening, surely the leaders need to be there and they need to be praying, not arriving late. And So again, don't put the blanket down unless you want people to lie on it as a leader. But where it's laid down, leaders are there and they're praying and they're participating. 
worship. Years ago, I remember going to church in Brazil and trying to stir them up in worship. And I remember one of the elders at the back. And when worship started, he was sitting in his chair with his arms crossed. And I remember thinking, we'll never get this church to worship the way God says it should worship. I think one of the great measures of a church is how it worships. It's that intimate, loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. The first measure I'll have when I walk into a church is I'll just watch how it worships. I can see how much obedience is here by how you worship. I can see how much love is here by how you worship. So as a leader, are you setting an example in worship? Here's a question. The Bible has some things to say about it. Shout to the Lord. If you haven't shouted to the Lord yet, you haven't set an example because the Bible says you should. Sing to the Lord a new song. If you've not sung a new song, you're not set an example. You haven't broken through that yet. Bow down. Be still. That's an easy one. We've done that. All of us have done that one. <laughs> That's why dancing with all your might. With all your might. Like everything in you. Like I'm going to have a heart attack. We had one worship session years ago at one of our conferences. It was amazing. And before we started Josh Jane or 412, we were part of New Covenant. And in one of our worship sessions at our, at our conference, in one worship session, there were about three and a half thousand of us. One worship session, one meeting. One guy died of a heart attack, and one guy broke his leg. <laughs> one worship session. I kid you not. I kid you not. A man burst his heart dancing before the Lord. And you know what? His wife came up and shared. Said, yeah, it's an amazing story. He had all his life said, before he dies, he wants to experience one of those conferences. Never been able to go. Finally got the resources and the ability to go. And went to the conference finally. And in one of our worship sessions, danced so hard before the Lord that he burst his heart and he died. And she said, this is how he would. He was actually old. She said, this is how he'd want to go. He went in glory. Young men, we were like, I want to go like that too. <laughs> I want to die like that. I want to die in a wheelchair, on a bed. I want to die worshiping. Set an example for the believers. Set an example for the believers. They'll imitate your faith. Some of them will break through in worship because you broke through in worship. Don't be the lid of what God can do. I need to have a good sniff. Live in the light. Are you still seeking people to speak into your life? Hey, man, how am I doing? What am I not doing well? Because again, what you do ripples down into them. You can only take people where you've been. I remember, and I realizing this years ago, and I know others have taught it since then, but I remember just seeing this for the first time for myself about how Moses was in Egypt, and then God called him out, and he went, well, he, had a, he goes to the border of the promised land. He actually goes to Mount Sinai. Gets the call of God at Mount Sinai, goes back, leads Israel how far? To the promised land? To Mount Sinai. Gets the law, gets the promises, and dies because he sends spies to go look at the promised land. Can't take them where he hasn't been. You can only take people where you've been. If you want to build a church that's going to be generous, be generous. If you want to build a church that's going to love Jesus with everything, then love Jesus with everything. If you want to church, build a church that's going to be zealous and sold out for Jesus and how it worships, then be sold out in your worship. Set an example in everything. In love. Set an example in love. And your, your language should be people, 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 people. I need to finish. In faith, I mentioned that earlier. Purity. Live a sinless life, man, as best you can. There's no one perfect. There's, we all still fall short of the glory of God. But there's sin and there's sin. Be quick to deal with sin. Don't open the door. Stronger men than you have fallen because they flirted with it. 
You can't afford to flirt with sin. The Bible says that the, the, the fathers of our faith even hated clothing stained by corrupted flesh. In other words, if someone had been a sinner in those clothing, they didn't want to touch the clothes in case somehow they were contaminated. Watch men, watch porn, watch, watch yourself with these things. It's on your doorstep, it's knocking, it wants to devour you. Spirits of lust, demonic spirits wanting to take you out. Watch yourselves. Watch yourselves, because God sees. And what you do breaks down through you. In purity, in progress. Let everyone see your progress. And I'll finish with this. I've gone an hour. I can't believe I've gone an hour. Have I gone an hour? I have a progress. We are growing and moving forward. Here's the thing, guys. Where you are now, you've still, you still got something to do. Because you're not dead yet. There's one degree of glory to another. Be a learner, be a student, be moving forward all the time. Realize every little battle you win is one step closer to the promised land. Because Israel inherited the land God promised them one step at a time. We all want, give me my inheritance. It's going to start like this. One step, one step, one step, one step. Every battle you win moves you forward. And every battle you get stuck on causes you to get stuck you can spend 40 years in the wilderness and never walk in the promise. Or you can move from one degree of glory to another. Beat your body into shape. Run your race to win the prize. If you fall and fail, get before God. The Bible says we have a high priest who ever lives to intercede for us. The Bible says we can come into his throne room freely in our time of need. God, help me in my time of need. I'm battling, I'm falling. Give me grace, please, so I can break through. The Bible tells us, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, it's filled with promises that Jesus makes to his people. And all of them are, this is the line, for him who overcomes, I will. For him who overcomes, I will. You call to be an overcomer. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. He will raise up your mortal body as he raised up Christ's dead body. You can break through by faith if you remain in him and he in you. He promises that you will bear fruit for the Father's glory. I don't care how many times you've fallen, God's power is able to break the stronghold of sin and death. He's a living God and he's with you and he wants you to succeed. He wants you to come through. He's looking for workers. I'm telling you, part of the reason why you, God is looking for workers. And I just to feel to finish this, this is not in my notes, but I remember when one of the times in Israel, God is looking to do something, and he always needs a man. And the Bible tells us that his eyes roamed to and forth across the earth. I, I, the picture is so just eyes roaming. Who, who will go? Who can I send? And God's looking for somebody that says, yeah, Lord, me. I'm here, I'm your man, I'm your woman, I'm here. And, and it's like his eyes are roaming across backwards and forwards. Who will go? And then one man, hears the call and goes, yeah, ma, I'm here. Pick me. Uh, it's going to be by grace, God, because I can't do this without you. But I'm, I'm your man, I'm here. My life is yours. I'll give myself to you. And men like that change history. God is still wanting to change history, to bring it to his son. But it's going to take men and women saying, we hear, Lord. We will seek your kingdom. We'll beat our bodies into shape. We'll run our race. We'll do whatever. We want you to get your glory on the earth. And so I want to pray with you in closing today. We'll pick us up tomorrow again and move into some other subjects. But I do feel like in this moment, the Lord is looking. And I know... It's a process, and I know there's, there's steps towards it. We can't run faster than he'll let us. We can't go beyond the place he's taken us. But we can be found faithful where we are. And we can lift our hand and say, Lord, I'm here, God. I'm here for your glory. Take my life and use it, Lord. And I feel like if you're just there and you're just saying, God, I'm guessing you're all going to respond because you're here, because you want to do this. But I do feel it's good for us sometimes to just respond to the Spirit in the moment. We've been hearing the price. We've been hearing what it is that we're going to have to walk through. We've been hearing that it's going to 
kill our flesh. It's going to cause us to not live for ourselves, to live for him, to live for others, to lay down our lives, to pay a greater price than what's even asked because we want to. But if you want to, if you're saying, God, make me like that, I want to be one of those that brings your kingdom, your power, your rule, and your reign. Then let's stand before him quickly in closing. Father, we, we are yours. You bought us with your blood, the blood of your son. And Jesus, you have saved us, and not only saved us, but you've called us to be those who'd be workers in your vineyard, members of your body. <laughs> we hear God. Would you take our lives? Would you take all of us? and use us for your glory. Father, teach us how to win the battle in the secret place. Teach us how to overcome. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that we're not on our own. You're with each one of us to teach us and disciple us, to teach us to be obedient to the King. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would work in us and through us. For some of us here that have got stuck or we, we, we've lost sight of the big picture or we've maybe even fallen in an area. Would you break the power of sin and death, God, in this moment? And would you restore and redeem? And would you bring us through into all that you have for us? For your name's sake, that the nations of the world would see the beauty of Christ reflected through his church, his body. And that as members of your body and those that might lead within the house, that we would lead as servants of the living God, as members of your body, as those who have learned your ways, full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit, God. Form yourself in us. Father, and I think for each of us, let us win the battle we face and move on and move on and move on that our progress will be visible to all until we stand before you one day in glory, God. Amen and amen. 